Hey Bruno, uh, I heard you were running a test on some composite materials and we wanted to come over and take a look. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks Daryl. Actually today we're going to run a Poisson's Ratio using D3039 ASTM standard. Uh, for this test, uh, we have selected a Vichet Micro Measurement uh, strength gauge. It's a C2A125 uh, LT 350. Uh, the good news for us, we already have pre-wired cables on it and it's going to save us some time as far as running ah, the test. So the C2A series gauges, they have wires pre-attached, so all you have to do is glue the gauge on the composite? Correct. Uh, we don't have to do any soldering. Uh, the only thing we have to do in this case, um, here internally we like to use connectors. It makes it simpler to attach the actual cables okay. while we run the test. Uh, otherwise, it's um, basically we uh, glue the gauge on and uh, we're ready to run the test. And these are 125 LTs, which if I remember correct, that's a two element T rosette, correct? Correct, it's a 090 orientation. So basically for the Poisson's ratio, as we all know, it's a transverse strain over the actual strain uh, ratio. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we need to have both ratings. And um, out of curiosity, what'd you glue it on with? Uh, basically in this case, for most composite materials, we like to use AE10 internally. Uh, the reason being is composites have a tendency not to always be totally flat and AE10 has a you know, perfect uh, covering and allows the gauge to be totally flat on the surface, which is important in this case. We don't want to have a gauge that actually has a waviness to it because the Poisson's ratio is really two axes that you're looking at, so they want to be parallel at all points. Gotcha, gotcha. So the AE10 is a good filler, like if the surface is rough, you're saying the AE10 can kind of fill that surface. Correct. Uh, without, if you use an M-Bone 200 per se, in some cases, it might be more convenient because of speed, but it might not fill the surface properly and you might not have the readings you're looking for. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, as far as using the 125 size gauge for this test, this is the minimum requirement from the STM. Normally, in this case, we're going to use 125. We know the material, we know what to expect. There's cases where it would be very appropriate to use a 250 uh, size gauge gotcha. which actually will cover a bigger area and and in this case we use a really tight knit fabric a G10 is a really knit fabric that's really small when you have a bigger fabric you want to have a little bit bigger surface so you actually have a more gotcha. representative area of that sample right I think we've got a 250 version of that same uh, strain gauge so. uh, the LTs or UTs are commonly used for this type of test internally we use LTs and UTs it really depends on what product we're testing and the availability okay. of the product at that point. Yeah, I think the UTs are CEA gauges, so those... Correct. They have to be soldered on. Yeah, you put leads For on. large quantity tests, we normally solder because we just make them in batches. Um, sometimes it's convenient to have pre-cable gauges for, you know, internally. Gotcha. It's easier to use as well. Gotcha. And you've got a, obviously a, a tensile frame here. What kind of capacity is that? This, this test, normally we would never test this on this type of frame. And the reason being is composite material, you usually don't use a 2,000 pound capacity frame. Um, this is a 2,000 pound capacity frame. We're using it today just because we're doing process ratio, which means we're not necessarily going to failure. Understood. We're going to stay within the elastic portion of that curve which means 2,000 pounds will be plenty for what we're trying to do. Okay. Normally we would go and use 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, or even 68,000 pounds, which we have here for bigger coupons. If I look at a D3039 sample, um, this is uh, actually a, a higher capacity type specimen, where in this case you have actual tabs already pre-attached, and you would attach the gauge in a similar fashion that you have here. Basically you would just glue it on and test it exactly the same way. The reason why we're not using tab is we're going very low capacity in this case. Okay. And this material will not really slip through the grips. And if you were testing this one though, that's where you're saying you'd use a higher capacity frame. You would need a higher capacity to break this. You're probably in the neighborhood of 20,000 pounds to break something like this. Wow. Okay. Um, you'll be in a 10 to 15,000 in most cases. Uh, for this specimen, you're probably talking about four to 5,000 pounds to break it. So a 2,000 pound frame will not get you there, gotcha, obviously. Gotcha. Okay. 2,000 pound frames and 1,000 pound frames and even lower frames are usually made, you're getting toward more the fibers um, testing, you're getting towards the thermoplastic type testing as well. Okay. So Since gonna, we're doing thermoplastic here internally as well, that's why we have a frame like this. So. Okay, so you're going to put that in the... We're going to install it in the jaws and the important part here is we have to make sure that we're aligned properly. 
because we're testing a really axle and transverse so we want to make sure the axle is really axle so basically we try to make it as straight as possible and you know some of that is visual there's an actual alignment fixture that exists out there that really allows you to align this specimen perfectly mm -hmm. and the grips perfectly before you run your test so when the specimen is actually set inside the grips you'll see on the actual screen there's significant offsets and some of that is because as you tighten up the grips you might put some slight compression on it mm -hmm. and you can also have some transverse slow depending on how you load it okay so the first thing you want to do and you see i have a compressive load of seven pounds because i already had pre-zero the actual value gotcha. i want to take some of that out if possible so now i got a positive which means i basically almost zero out the load on it the actual um, strain on my coupon now what I want to do is basically trim the excess of that strain out. Okay, and you're using, so you've got the wires run into these 2310A signal conditioning amplifiers. These are, these are used to take that signal from the strain gauge and condition it and provide a higher level output, correct? Correct. Basically what we're doing is we're exciting the gauge and then we're taking the signal out amplifying it to a 0 10 volt output which we send to the conditioner signal of the Instron and tell them, hey, now you're gonna be looking at a zero 10 volt signal, which is gonna be basically transferred to strain at that point. Gotcha, gotcha. So now, like I said, we're gonna trim, we're already at trim, um, for the most part, uh, strain number two here is the transfer strain. Strain one on the screen is basically actual. Okay. The goal is try to get as close as possible to zero. If you look right now, we've got minus 0.31, and this is roughly one and, and so that's that's one micro strain right so correct. that's one part in a million a change which is a very very small amount so when you're when you're down at fractions of a micro strain you're basically cutting hairs in in very small fashion here <laughs> uh, it basically if you look at this um the best way to describe this and and as you, you know, when you look at microstream, what is it? It's a one inch over a roughly 16 mile long journey. So when we're looking at half of that, you're looking at something very, very small. Right. So having close to zero or, or even one microstream will not hurt right. the right. situation. Understood. Understood. Very small quantity. Okay. So now we're going to balance the load because basically we're going to start the test. And here we go. So now the frame is basically displacing at 0 0.05 inches per minute. And what that does is basically now we're recording both load displacement, if you see the extension, and the strain in both directions. You can see that we're, we're at 250 pounds, 260, 270. Strain levels are 1,200, minus 200. So right now you see a factor of one to six or so. Yeah. Uh, which will give you roughly point, you know, 0.14 or 0.12, which is basically what this material will do. I got you. So that gives you, you could actually calculate right now as the test is running to see basically where you think you're going to be at. Um, but we you're, went, you're expecting a plus on ratio for that material. Yeah, we've, test, you, we've tested this material many times, so we know roughly where it should be. Obviously, if we get something totally different, we might call the manufacturer or our customer and say something happened. Um, but otherwise, we'll run it until a thousand pound, which is going to give us plenty of range okay. to calculate this value. Okay. Right now we're roughly at 830 pounds. We have 3,000 micro strain, almost 4,000 micro strain, and 500 the other way in transverse. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, the transverse is negative, which is normal. We're basically compressing the specimen as we're stretching. Yeah, you can almost see it. I mean, as you start to get to higher and higher levels, you'll start to see a little bit of necking of the composite. And okay, right now we're going to stop the test. Okay to see what kind of value we're getting. Okay, so we're at about what, 1,200 pounds, almost 1,200? Yeah, we're at 1,200 now. We've got uh, roughly, I will stop the test and, and you can actually look at, the strain will continue to display. And if you look now, is we've got some relaxation in the specimen. We kept the load pretty much the same, we're roughly 1,200 pounds, but now the specimen, if you look at the strain, they're actually relaxing a little bit and that's normal. You would expect that out of this product. 
So if you look now on the curve, we got a standard stress strain curve that you see here, basically mm -hmm. load displacement. And if you look at your Poisson's ratio that's already displayed, it's 0.1465. It's within the range we were expecting. Gotcha. gotcha. So this is basically in a nutshell how you would run a uh, Poisson's ratio type test. Uh, when you're using this type of setup, the good news is you have repetitive coupons to test with the amplifiers already preset. You just basically connect the new specimen, trim everything out, take the zeros, and restart the test. And you can test fairly rapidly several specimens at a time. Gotcha. So all you have to do is put another gauge on a new coupon, take the wires, crimp some new connectors on it, plug that in, maybe some fine tuning on the amplifiers, so then you're off and running. Again. Basically, each gauge will have a slight different offset from one to the other. You have okay. to take that offset off basically by just resetting the actual amplifier uh, offsets. And then from that point on, the, the actual calibration curve being the same gauge or the same, and you just keep on running the same test. Fantastic. That's great. So we appreciate you uh, taking the time to show it to us, Bruno. Thank you. You have a great day. Thanks.